Yeah, it doesn't even look like a thunderstorm. We ain't skiers. Okay, come on, let's get these bikes. Mate, this is my friend Amy Brown. Nice to meet you. And her husband Jason Brown. Hey Nate, how are you? Doing well. Nice to meet you. They own this fine bicycle shop where I I bring my stuff to Jason and I say, I have no idea what is happening here. I need you to just fix it for me. So yesterday when we decided yesterday to plan this to go on a bike ride, I said, Jason, here's all my bikes. I need you to fix them by tomorrow. just something to get me to work and back. That's it. Yeah. Um, so when it was taken, I was like, okay, I guess some kid needed it for a birthday, maybe. Yeah. Because it, it wasn't it wasn't even big enough for me. So I was just I was using it just to ride. Back I was gonna before. say you were. Did you buy a children's bike because it was cheaper? Yeah, because it was what I could afford. It was at affordable. The time. Yeah, yeah. Because I couldn't I couldn't afford an adult size bike at that time. Gotcha. So I bought a kid's bike in my first apartment, and there was not really anywhere to park it, so I was just gonna leave it outside and chain it up. But with no lock, hoping that no one would like realize. Test it. And they tested it and they took it. So then I was like, okay, I guess yeah. I'll just buy a pass and use public transportation now. So, uh, yeah. Dang. So when was that in like in your lifeline? Twenty sixteen. So I was twenty twenty five. Yeah, I was twenty five at the time. Twenty sixteen, that was not that long ago. No, it was five years ago, yeah. Uh, it was when I first moved to Chicago. Um, I didn't I didn't know anyone in the city and I didn't have I had two hundred dollars my car and that's it. I didn't want to use my car because I couldn't afford gas to drive it around the city and it was super difficult. So I just bought a cheap bike and that thing lasted like a week or two. It didn't last very long. So yeah. why, why did you go there? Well, I went there uh, for Second City. So the, the big comedy institution that all your big comedians go through. Uh, and you name a comedian, they have some sort of attachment to Second City. Bob Odenkirk, Steve Colbert, Steve Carell. They all went there. So I auditioned for conservatory and August of 2000, no, in June of 2016. So I didn't have any money at the time. I borrowed against my bank account. I talked to my bank and I could go $500 overdraft. Oh, so I just okay. went ahead and did a $500 overdraft knowing I had 30 days to pay it back. Used that $500 to drive up to Chicago. And I stayed with a friend of a friend in her apartment on her couch. Uh, auditioned for Second City's conservatory program, which was like a 15 minute thing then hopped in my car and drove right back to Virginia, then waited a month for them to get decisions on who got into their conservatory program, because you're, you're auditioning to get in. Uh, I got in, so I then, I thought I wasn't going, I thought I was gonna fail, because it, it, not a lot of people get in on their first time, so I was expecting, do it once, now I know what it's like, I'll do it a second time. Uh, I, I got in the first time unexpectedly, so then I had to work really hard to make as much money as I could in a month to pay off my overdraft and have money to move to Chicago where I knew someone who lived outside of the city, but I didn't know anyone in the city. So while I'm doing all this, my car is behind 90 days at this point. Oh. So they're actively trying to find it. To, to find repossess. it and you're hiding it? Yeah, I'm like driving it around, knowing yeah. it has a tracker in it, but trying to park it in places where they can't really tow it out. Uh, and I ended up having to pay that, which caused me to have only $200 left to my name total when I drove up there. So like from Virginia to Chicago, I had $200 to get there. Not to live there, exist. Not to live, yeah. just to get there. Just to get there. And then when I got there, uh, the people I was living with, they were like, hey, we don't want to live here anymore. We want to kind of buy our own home, so we're going to move out of this place where they were renting, which meant that I had nowhere to go because they were moving in with his parents. Um, and that was like the, the third or fourth day that I was there, maybe. My classes hadn't gosh. even started yet in the city. Oh, my God. So I started August 31st classes. I moved up like August 20th or something like that. And between that time, I had moved in with them, 
they let me stay with their parents for like a little bit, not too long, because I was sleeping on a couch. I ended up finding an apartment in four jobs between Tuesday and Friday. So oh, one of the gosh. jobs put an advance forward for me to move. I was going to say, how did you even get into an apartment? I was doing back end coding for some company. I don't know how to do back end coding. <laughs> um, they had there was an. An advertisement on Craigslist saying they're hiring, they'll take anyone with a pulse. That was like basically what the ad said. So I, I applied for it, they took me, and I got paid $10 an hour, which was great to have a little money to eat. Uh, and it was at some coffee shop, and as I was doing the work, I finished mine faster than everyone else just because I know macros in Excel, because I've had a ton of random jobs throughout my life. And since I knew macros, it was as simple as like learning the key bindings, and I could copy and paste and move things around really quickly. So they were impressed by how fast I moved, me not telling them that I knew macros, just, I just did it quickly. <laughs> so she asked if I wanted a full-time position, helping her build out the rest of her website that she was going to launch. Uh, some website for kid, for parents to find classes for their kids to go through. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'd gladly do it. But the only thing is, like, I don't have anywhere to live right now, so if you just put up an advance, like one month of pay, I'll go ahead and work this whole month for free, well, not for free, for that pay, so that you can just, you pay, the payment to get me into an apartment so I can live somewhere. Yeah. She was like, yeah, I don't mind doing that. So she did it, and then in that month, I learned how to do the job of the back end code uh, while like sitting on the floor in the box apartment, um, kind of on my own. And then I, I also worked the early morning shift at Starbucks because I needed evenings. So I was up at three every day. Uh, I would, at first, ride my bike there, but then after a couple of weeks, I would hop the train. Uh, I think one time some dude, I got a ride from a guy I don't even know who he was. He was just like, I'm heading south. You want to go? He's like, I need to get to work. He dropped me off. He just, he did. I trusted him. He did. It was really weird. I don't know why I did that. Uh, but I worked at Starbucks. And then right after Starbucks, it would end at 9. Up the street from there was an escape room that I was helping with build out. And I was going to work as one of the game masters of the escape room. So that always started at 9.30. So I'd go straight from Starbucks into the escape room. And I worked there from 9.30 to 5. And then if I didn't have class in the evening, uh, which it was once a week at Second City. When I got home uh, around like 5.30, 6 o'clock, I would then start doing the back-end coding for the website until I fell asleep to wake up and do it all over again. If I had a class, then I wouldn't do coding that night. I'd just have to add on to the next day. Right. And that was my life for like three or four months. Were you in the conservatory that whole time, or how long were you there? For roughly about a year to a year and a half, I was in conservatory. No, it was just a year. It was one year of conservatory. And the other two years, I was just kind of performing at clubs, doing what I could do to try to make it, quote unquote, as they say. Yeah. Um, and then at the end of those three years, I, I moved back for Swan City because it was way bigger than anything I was doing in Chicago. So I decided to get, come back and spend all my time seeing what I could do with it. It was yeah. great. So who are your influences? None. I Anybody who's good at the craft? So I, I'd say I, I have influences now, but they're recent. Uh, I gotcha. So like I didn't know that there were people who had names in their craft. Right. I just thought it was a thing that you did for fun. So when I started, I didn't know that there was this large world where most of your comedy actors did improv first, like Will Ferrell and uh, Amy Poehler and Tina Fey. I didn't yeah. know that. I just knew that there's this thing in this small city I'm from that I have fun doing and I feel like I'm really good at. So I didn't have any influences or idols because I, I started doing stand-up when I was like eight. But stand-up, I had more people that I would watch. But at the same time, I still, I was very sheltered in a conservative Christian household. So I didn't have access to a ton of comedy to know like, this is good, this is bad. I just had things. I noticed that if I would say this, they'd laugh and mm -hmm. that was fun. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have too many influences of what I do. But I have a lot of people now that I look up to because I've seen them perform or play and they do an amazing job like every single time they're constantly on yeah it's like uh, TJ and Dave TJ Jagodowski I think his name is and Dave something the two guys who are in the Sonic commercials where they'll make quick bit jokes they have a show every single Wednesday or had a show every single Wednesday at the Improv Olympic Theater for five dollars and they were really good and there's a lot of people that came up with me through Second City that I'm like man they're very good at doing comedic uh, storytelling yeah. But outside of that, I don't, I don't really have a ton of people that I'm like, man, this is someone that I've always wanted to be. Yeah. Because I didn't know that you could be that. Right. So did you figure out on your own that acting, performing, comedy um, is not pretend? 
it's got to be real. Did you figure that out on your own, or did you? Yes and no. Did you learn that? Yes and no. Uh, so I started acting uh, in school at like four years old. I was Dr. Bunny in a play, and I just didn't stop doing it because I like being in front of people. I think the idea that it's got to be rooted in a real place or from a place of truth, that's a recent thing for me. That's like the past maybe four to five years, and it kind of came hand in hand with me leaving my faith behind as well, because to me, most things with that are not real or true. And that was most of my comedy growing up, where I'm not trying to tell you what I actually believe or feel, I'm trying to tell you what is right according to what this book told me. Right. So my comedy has to be filtered through this weird way instead of me just saying, I think this is funny, or right. I think this is true. Yeah. So I have a lot of unlearning and kind of breaking that away. Whereas my improv has always been true because I'm playing characters. And yeah, the characters so. are, this is my cousin uh, that I'm playing right here, and he has a certain way he talks, this is my grandfather that I'm playing, or mm -hmm. I saw this dude on a train once, and this is what I'm playing. So yeah. I'm playing the honesty I believe that comes from them. Yes. From Yes. So that's more. I had a, um, a colleague once uh, when I was teaching, and uh, we were just having a casual conversation, and he said, um, well, don't you teach lying? Is it, <laughs> don't you teach the art of lying? And I said, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, it's the most profound thing I've ever said, I think. Um, but I just said, you know, we're not lying. We're just telling someone else's truth. Yeah. You yep. know, that's the key. Yeah. That's the whole key to it all. I was told by one of my teachers, because I'm, I'm black but I don't look it, so I'm always afraid to play black characters on stage, even though I know so, like my family, I know so many characters to play. Like my great aunt who will eat half of her meal and then tell the kitchen that she has to send it back because it's cold and she's not paying for it. So it's like, you've already eaten <laughs> your fill and you're sending it back. Like that's a weird character trait. Uh, and his thing was similar to yours, where I'm not playing what I think a black person would be. I'm playing someone I know. I'm yeah. playing a character, not a caricature. Right. So there's a difference between the two. One of them is, I'm just trying to play up stereotypes for a laugh. The other is, this is how I remember my grandfather being. Like, yeah. he would just dive into terrifying war stories about Korea. For no reason other than he had PTSD and didn't know what it was at the time. So yeah. he just kind of held on to that for a while. So here I am, like six or seven years old, learning about how someone in, next to him in a fossil got their head blown off. And he just reached over and grabbed a cigarette and continued smoking. Like, right. I'm six, yeah. I don't even know that. Right. But those things come with being a character and not a caricature. It's the truth that I believe they imparted to me. Yeah. Magic isn't bad, right? Or Lord of the Rings, right? Because they had Christ allegories. Yes. So no Harry Potter. I didn't watch the Harry Potter movies until uh, I was about to graduate high school and move to college. And in like one day, I borrowed all the VHSs from a friend and watched every single one in a row through the night and everything. 
before I left for college because Seven Part Two is coming to theaters, and I knew a great way to make friends would be, hey, let's go see Harry Potter, only to go to a Christian college and everyone would be like, no, I've not seen that either. <laughs> <laughs> I completely, 100% understand. So it, back in my day, um, it was no Smurfs, no He-Man, because there's only one master of the universe. Yes, that was the same phrase for Power um, Rangers. Yes. <laughs> there's only one savior of the world. Yes, yeah. yes. So um, couldn't watch Labyrinth. Um, <laughs> Icon, have you seen it? Yeah, but it's it's good that you didn't watch Labyrinth as a kid. But... <laughs> It's, very, it's a terrifying movie. I, but I wanted to watch it. Well, I'm glad that you have gotten your Harry Potter education now. I have. Multiple. I've not read the books, though. And, I've watched the movies, though. And we're going to go the proper speed limit for the rest of the way. Exactly. We'll ride straight into a wall. I don't know target that, but... Ride straight into a wall to go to Hogwarts. Here we go. talked about um, your, I'm putting it in my terms and then you clarify, um, we talked about your identity crisis of sorts, um, you know, being um, a white man and also being a black man and the white community doesn't consider you white, but the black community doesn't consider you black. Is that the, the conversation that we had? Clear, clear us up. I want to talk, I want you to talk more. Race shouldn't exist. It's not real. It is a man-made concept. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a lot of time trying to fit myself in something that wasn't built for people like me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've kind of just stepped away from it as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I still understand and see the injustice and the inequality and the problems within it. But I, I'm of the mindset now that it just needs to be defined differently than what it is. Because mm -hmm. The way it works historically is the one drop rule is kind of what it's based around, where if you have even one drop of you that isn't white, you're quote unquote impure or black. It's extremely similar to the ideals of Nazi Germany with the Aryan race. The only difference is we as a nation have not addressed it as being a problem ever. We've never owned up and said, well, you know, all that was a mistake. We apologize for it. We're going to rectify it moving forward. We're going to change the system to fix it. That hasn't happened. And it probably won't happen because the system works for a lot of very powerful rich people. And not a lot of people, but just a lot of powerful rich people. Mm -hmm. So it's going to stay the same way it is until you can upset that balance. And uh, I guess once you start attacking people's pocketbooks, that's when things start to actually change. Mm -hmm. it is, no one really cares about black or white because we all know that's not real. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Like, we'll fight over it and you can have arguments over it and you can get upset over it, but it's not real. There is no black person. There is no white person. Mm -hmm. The only reason that they were called black is because brown was already used when the British invaded India. Mm -hmm. And they get to Europe, they get to Africa, and they're like, "Well, what do we call these people? They're brown too." Like, I don't know. They're darker brown. Darker brown. It's like that doesn't work. We gotta have some <laughs> snappier. They call them black. I'm pretty sure that's some stand-up comedian's joke that I just stole. Uh, I don't know who it is, but essentially that's the idea. Is like, there is no such thing as a black person, and there's no such thing as a white person either. Like that's just not true. But their label is used to keep people in positions of financial power. Black people were the the money. Like you were, you were literally just you were cattle, chattel, or whatever the word is. You were yeah. just you were used to make someone a lot of money. And if you're white, you were the one who got the money. Yeah. That's that's all that it was put in place for. It's a Indian caste system, but simplified. Yeah. Uh, so it, if if that is a thing that doesn't exist and doesn't need to exist, then I I don't want to continue living my life confused trying to fit into an identity that I don't think should be there anymore. Yeah. And like the the reason Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated wasn't because of what he did 
getting rights for black Americans in the civil rights movement. He was about to start the poor people's movement. And the FBI just didn't want that to happen because a lot of this nation is built on keeping poor people poor and rich people rich. So if he's about to do that, and we saw what he just did with something that to them didn't really matter because you're still going to be oppressed because that's how the system was built 200, 300 years ago. Like, it was built for that. It's yeah. not the people anymore, so stop directing your anger at the people. It's just a part of the system. They are ignorant to it. They don't understand it. Yeah. So it's uh, it's just a retargeting of where my efforts go, and it's no longer to figure out my identity because I'm just me. And by 2045, I think it is, everybody is going to be just me. I hope so. You don't even have to hope. People love fucking each other. <laughs> you just don't have to hope. <laughs> And you always assume the grass is greener on the other side. There's going to be no purebreds left. Not is a what single you're saying, one. By, not a single one. By 2045. One. Not no. We will be purer breads because mm. we'll have more to pull from than just oh, yeah. one. Yeah. Like think about living your entire life being just English. What do you have to look forward to? Bland fish and chips and jacked up teeth. Like come on, <laughs> it's not something to be happy about. If you're Colombian and you also have some Chinese descent, now you've got like a ton of festivals. You just, you've got so many things to do. You've got culture, you got flavor, you've got rhythm, you've got so, so much more. If you're just happy that you're English or Aryan, what do you got? You're gonna come in fourth place in any sport you compete in. Like, it's just how it is. It, you just, that's it. You got nothing in advantage on anyone else. Right. And you're not smarter, because you're Aryan. Like, it's, you think that only one type of people is the best. Right. But that's not true. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a different space from when we talked before. Yeah, okay, so fast forward to, um, I believe it was 2020, was it in 2020? Uh, we were wearing masks, but I don't think we were. October, um, I believe. Or yeah, maybe, we weren't uh, yeah, vaccinated October. yet. There was uh, no or, vaccine. Yeah. No vaccine and had been released. you did the um, open mic night, comedy open mic night, and um, we wore our masks, although, I didn't realize we were supposed to keep it on. Like, you know, we were trying to figure out how yeah. this whole mask thing works, you know? So we took them off at the table, and then I think that was kind of pointless. But um, anyway, we learned. It was a learning experience. Yeah. Um, so at the end of that show, I believe there were uh, seven comedians. That number doesn't really comedians. matter. Let's just say. We'll call them comedians. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll boost their egos. <laughs> Um, so seven people got up on stage. There we go. That sounds better. Yeah. Um, and did their bits. And actually, the last one, I don't remember his name. I wouldn't recognize him on the street. But he, he was pretty funny. Yeah. Like, you know, in that group, that yeah. that was a strong one to end on. Yep. Um, and you were pulling names out of a hat, but I don't believe that. Um, I was. Were, were you really? Yeah, absolutely. And you really yeah. just picked the funniest one out of the bunch to go last? That or, was a or pure accident. I think yeah, it was a pure accident. was the funniest I, one. I'm not going to try to put them in order. It's Lakeland stand-up comedians. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's, well, that's, hey, now, don't, like, what's that dog people who are trying? Well, right? Kind of. Kind I won't of? dog, okay, so I won't dog anyone, that. I won't dog anyone who's trying, but okay. I will dog people who I've heard the exact same set word for word every single time you've done an open mic. Oh, okay. Or people where you're, you're not even trying, like, you just know you can get behind a microphone and say stuff. You're just not, you're not attempting. You're not doing anything that's pushing an envelope. Okay. But the, you think you're pushing an envelope because you're like, oh, he just said inappropriate things. Wow, he was derogatory towards women again. It's, it's not comedy. It's yeah. not. So I, it's Lakeland stand-up comedy. It's people where they're not going to be able to do it anyways. Yeah. I hate the constant sex jokes. Um... You yeah. know, I mean, some some sex jokes are funny, like some, you know. You can do it well. They're not going to do it well. I, I it's hard listening to sex jokes list. from dudes who don't have sex. <laughs> That's it. I don't believe it's real. That's not real. <laughs> they they're sitting in their room, uh, Cheetos bag open and Mountain Dew, <laughs> watching anime, and they're like, you know, it'd be a great joke if me and Sasuke were to have sex. What would I do to her? <laughs> like that's what that's what you got. So you're going to hear these weird sex stories from dudes who don't even know what it is. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Okay. Let's move way yes. past yeah, that. Let, let's move way yeah. past that. Okay. So at the end of this, these sets, then you get up on stage. <laughs> and I'm thinking, all right. 
Now we're, you know, we're going to get the good stuff now. We're, that He waited until the end so we could, you know, end on this really great set. I'm so sorry. And, and I brought, I had, you know, yeah. invited friends. And so I was like, oh, this is the funny one. The way I remember it is that you got up and said, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything. Um, you know, I, I'm not writing right now because I... Nothing's funny. Everything sucks, and nothing's funny right now. And you, I remember you saying that you weren't sure if you were ever going to write again. Mm -hmm. And wow, that was a downer. <laughs> and also, <laughs> it was a massive downer. The the whole night. I felt so terrible for the guy that went right before you because he was actually yeah, he pretty did, funny. He did comedy. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh man. He just totally crapped, took a big dump yep. on that dude's set. Yep. But also, I'm an empath. And as soon as you said that, I was like, Ugh. you know, I mean, it was just a gut punch. And I remember thinking at the time, I wondered if you would ever write again yeah like you know like i could i know i can't experience your life yeah but i could totally feel i, I could feel the feels and i was like choked and i'm here with my friends and all i wanted to do was have more conversation with you about what was going on with you so let's do that today because i yeah. had the opportunity to do that my one thing in life that I always have wanted to be and wanted to achieve is a stand-up comedian. I just, I love it. It's one person almost against a tie, an entire room and they're doing the impossible. They're taking, they're going from nowhere and making everyone go on this journey and laughing. Like, Man, I want that so bad. Um, but I just, I don't have anything in my head that's funny. Because every time I sit down to write jokes, I want to go from like a position of truth and research and look into things. And I was just doing research to try to get angles on how to make any of this funny. But it just, unless we start doing fantasy stuff, like with improv, I'll easily, I can make improv funny anytime because I'm, I'm like uh, riding a laser tiger into the moon, you know, like that's, come on, that's, it's easy. But when you're, when I'm, I'm trying to be honest when I do stand up or when I used to do stand up uh, and try to tell the truth with what I'm doing. So I think less of, I think I'm less of a stand-up comedian and more of just a storyteller. And mm -hmm. I think that's what I got to lean into. Mm -hmm. um, so at that time, I was like, I don't, I don't want to tell a joke. I don't want to sit up here and say some stupid one-liner with a punchline mm -hmm. while the world is literally crumbling around us. And it's like, it's almost like we had heart issues. And what, what happened last year was we were able to pull back all the stuff that was protecting it and see like, oh, they, there's more than just heart issues. Like our liver's jacked up, we got a problem with our lungs. Like there's so much more wrong with this nation because that's what, I mean, it's what COVID-19 did, it shut everything down. People had six months to think. Mm -hmm. And now that's where we are on this side. It's like, we've been able to think, we've been able to assess what we've been doing collectively as a society and it sucks. And all the older people, like 60 plus, they're going back to business as usual because they've spent 60 years doing it. Mm -hmm. All the people my age are like, well, I haven't enjoyed the past 20 something years yeah. at all. And now I've had time to realize why I haven't enjoyed it. It's because the people who are 60 plus have really fucked it up for me. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't want to do stand up the way that it's been done anymore. And I don't think, I don't know if it'll work. I don't know if I'll ever get paid for it or attention for it but i know that if i get 30 people in the room those 30 people will be able to hear me tell what i believe is the truth about what i think and tell mm -hmm. stories that i think deserve to be told um and that's it and if it never goes past the 30 people then i've, I've done what i needed to do and i've gotten it out yeah so you mentioned people in their 60s are just back to business and um people your age um, which my kids are not quite your age, but they're close. Um, they, would you say that it's true that um, I've experienced that they have really struggled? Um, so one, my eldest is 27 um, and my youngest is um, 20, will be 23 this month. Um, and they have experienced 
getting going through college, getting degrees, my eldest has a master's, and then getting out into the job world and just having the shit kicked out of them and trying to find housing. You were talking earlier about trying to live in Chicago and working four jobs to be able to afford a studio apartment. Um, and I think that it has really taken a toll on your generation feel it constantly feeling like you aren't adequate like I can't would you say that's true that it's like you know it's this constant feeling of I work like a dog I do the best that I can and then I'm still in this studio apartment yeah, I think there are people. Four jobs. I think there are people who definitely think that way. Um, I, I, I'm not one of the people who thinks that way. Okay. Because I just don't care. Yeah. I understand everything is completely and totally fine, like completely, and it's not by my doing or anyone around my yeah. age either. Yeah. I just had a conversation with my mom yesterday. She's like, "If you have all these problems with what's going on with the system, why don't you get in there and change and run for office?" I said, "Well, it's." It's just going to chew me up and spit me out like every other person who thought they'd do that. Like, look at who is benefiting off the system. How old are they? Mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell is 80, 81. Nancy Pelosi is 79. And they're the two faces of the same coin. They're just opposite sides. Right. Both of them are monsters in their own right. That's how they got there. They became the monsters they went in that they thought they would change. And now they are 79 and 80 years old or 81. That's so old. Joe Biden is what, 78? Trump was 74. Two sides of the same coin. Not much difference between the two except one tweets less. That's really it. They all are cut from the exact same generational cloth. And that generation wants things a lot different than we do. I love my grandparents, love them to death. I would never in my life work for them, ever. We will not in any way see eye to eye. They have a different idea of what they want from life for us than we do for us. So if we have 81-year-old, 79-year-old people, that means that if we're going back to talking about uh, rights for uh, African Americans, Black Americans, however you want to refer to that, mm -hmm. that means that they were 26 years old or 25 years old when the Civil Rights Act was passed. That is the age of your children when the Civil Rights Act was passed. So for the first 26 to 27 years of their life, it, their, black people were not people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one quarter of their entire life has been that way. There ain't no way that they're doing anything for the normal person today. And if they're 80, they've been in office for 30 years, that's about how old I am. They don't know what it's like to be a normal person. They've never had to pay for anything in their life. They've never had to worry about money. They've never had to worry about housing. They've just taken lobbyer money if they need more and then voted a different way. There's nothing in our current government or our current system that is to benefit any normal human today. It's just not possible. It's been going so long. It's so bloated and it's so filled with antiquated old laws and things that people don't need that yes, it's, it's difficult for anyone to exist today. Did you know that uh, there was a successful coup on American soil? Didn't know that. Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898. Predominantly black Congress. Predominantly black in Wilmington, North Carolina. Most wow. of the people serving in government were black. Huh. There was a lot of them. Uh, white people didn't like that. So 2,000 white people armed came to the Capitol, forced all of them out, and completely reinstated the current government. An insurrection happened on American soil and they blamed it on black Americans and women. So if you read the newspapers from that time, what it says is, rabble rousers, we got them out of here, basically. Right, right. That's not the truth. Yeah. American soil. Do you know that there were two instances of bombs being dropped on American soil from aircraft? Do you yeah. know those two instances were? No, come on, tell me. The first one was Tulsa. When they dropped bombs on the black neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and completely erased that neighborhood, they just went in and started killing everyone. There. And it was a it was a black neighborhood. It was known as Black Wall Street. A lot of people like to call it. It was just it was black people doing black things in a black neighborhood. And this is like 1918 or something. I don't remember the year, but it was early. So this is the first time planes were around, and some white dude was like, "You know what I can do for my plane? Drop right. bombs." 
yeah, just yeah. bumps. The second time, uh, 1973, I believe. I could be off on the date. It was in the 70s. Uh, on a project in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, somewhere in Pennsylvania. It's been a while since I've looked at the information. Uh, but uh, police choppers dropped napalm bombs on a couple of different projects buildings to try to kill, I believe, some Black Panther people. Do you know how old Fred Hampton was when he was shot in the back of his head in his bed next to his pregnant girlfriend? 21. Leader of the Black Panther Party shot in the back of the head at 21 by the FBI in his bed laying next to his pregnant girlfriend. 21. That's a kid. That is a kid. That's a kid. Leader of the Black Panther Party. So if you ever hear about Black Panthers and Fred Hampton, your brain, just because of how we're taught, is thinking like, right. this is some 50, 60-year-old dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Or at least 40. He started, yeah. I think, when he was 19, maybe 17. He was very young. And his whole goal, the, the goal of the Black Panthers, we want breakfast for kindergartners. Right. That's it. Yeah. It became more because we need to be armed to protect ourselves. So you, you don't know that. You don't know the truth. And, and you can't rely on what is reported for the truth, which is what makes it difficult and hard. Yeah. to parse through it is because what's reported is oh these dudes they love to kill so many people right. man like okay that's what the book says but what they actually did wasn't that they were literally a before school program to feed children breakfast yeah. and the FBI shot a 21 year old kid in the back of the head in his own apartment bed yeah. next to his pregnant yeah. so his son never got to meet his dad Fred Hampton Jr. Yeah, so, what what do we do with all of this? Okay, yeah, I mean, I get it. I mean, it's just recognizing that... So what now? Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah. It's a fantastic question. I think the first step is helping to know. And if enough people know, then eventually someone's going to hear about it and right. be like, well, we got to do something. Right. Acknowledge. It, <laughs> if you... Critical race theory should be taught. Yeah. It's not a controversial topic. It's just saying, hey, maybe decisions we made in America were based off this. Mm-hmm. It's it's hard to do much when uh, society is ran by the people who are from so long. Yeah. And and I don't I personally don't want to be one of the ones who gets into run society because I have to be a monster to get anyway. Right. I don't want to become a monster. Right. I like why. We were talking about recovery um, as it pertains to you. Where where are you at? It, it doesn't sound like you're anywhere near <laughs> recovery. Yeah. But, so where are you? Have you even started so to my, recover? Uh, my, my best friend called me six months ago, I think it was. He's like, hey, I'm renting a cabin in North Carolina for like three or four days, you, me, and a couple other guys, like people that have worked on film sets before, we've made movies together. We're just gonna go there and we're gonna have a writer's retreat to see if we can write something or like even shoot something. And as it got closer, the other three guys were like, no, this is what we've always done. We've always gone to the, like somewhere and instead of just enjoying it, we tried to shoot something. So as an audio guy, my friend's a director, writer, and the other guy's a DP, and I'm just usually acting and everything. So they were like, we're not going to write anything. We're just going to take a vacation. I was like, yeah, but I've had the intention for a while in my brain of setting like, this is the time that I will take to write something new. So I went up there and I spent about three or four hours, which isn't long, uh, writing all my new stuff. So I have uh, almost three hours worth of new material to go through. They each have their own title and they're ready to go because I've also come to terms with the fact that I'm not a writer uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I will not write anything. But I will improvise the shit out of it. Out of some ideas? Oh my god, yes. I will take all the ideas, stories, concepts, and just run with it. And I will create it in front of you, with you. Like, we're doing it together in this room, making it something different than a stand-up show that you just go see. Like, oh, it's the same thing you see every single time. It's comfortable. No. I'm. My goal is, I have these three concepts, and they each have their own bent and idea. And I just chase after so uh, the first one is of Mountains and Men, and that one is a riff of, of Mice and Men. And uh, it's kind of like me getting rid of my old ideas and what I used to be. The same concept with Lenny and George, where he 
takes him out with a gun, you know. Yeah. Uh, the second one is hot rain on a, or yeah, hot rain on a cold tin roof. And uh, no, cold rain on a hot tin roof. That's what it is. So that's the one of how my beliefs from when I was young just kind of evaporated. They're just gone. I just don't stick to them anymore. Mm -hmm. And the last one, it's not a clever title. It's just Am I Really Black, though? And that one is the whole, like, for so long I've wanted to be recognized as Black. But then if you look at Black history, it's like, I don't I don't want that trauma. I don't want that <laughs> generational issue. Like, I don't want to wake up every day knowing I, I am connected to something that has not been justified, has not been fixed, has not been apologized for you acknowledged it's not real so it never happened the slaves loved being on those plantations right have you not seen an aunt jemima bobby they didn't have to take care of themselves yeah how great is that they had Free housing and, and, yes. and something to do you ever pick yes. up it's really soothing no yeah. not not my thing so I, I don't know why and i don't know why i wanted to fight for being white there's no culture that's yeah. not that's not white isn't a culture all white it is is just not black. It's an anti-culture. White's the anti-culture. Black is the culture. But black's not even real. So how is there a culture with black? Doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> All right, let's go have some tacos and booze. Okay, I'm done for that. It's Taco Tuesday.